Great. Um, so this is something I've been working on for about three years now, I think. Three years. It's just about finished. It's probably, um, I don't know, five or six weeks away from being done. Then I'll send it to my publishers and we'll see what happens after that. So, um, and this is the first time it's ever been read in public. I've shown it to, like, you know, some people, but I've never really read it or um, aired it publicly. So. I guess this is its debut. So you're the guinea pigs. <laughs> I'll set it up for you a little bit. Um, it's the future. Um, climate change has happened, and and um, it's it hasn't turned out well for everybody. Refugees have been warehoused in Australia, and they've been put to work. How long could you live in a coconut palm? I do the calculations. How long, with the sun and winds of dry season, with mosquitoes and flies and ants, could you sleep? The first time you rolled, you would fall, so you wouldn't sleep. You'd live without sleep. When it rained, you'd tilt your mouth to the sky and drink. Food? I don't know. Coconuts, I suppose. Rats and lizards? You'd crack their necks and eat them raw. I want to tell Hassan that you could live a long time. Months, even. I want to tell him you could live for months on coconuts and water and rats and lizards. Even ants. But my heart isn't in it. I don't know, I say. Well, I do, Hassan says. Months. You could drink the rain. If you had a machete, you could cut the coconuts. Months. Easily. Hassan works in the station next to mine. He takes a motor from the assembly line and fits it. So it goes these long days. Our fingers work while our minds revisit the past. The blue and red and green shells of the Tarba pet rolls by on the conveyor. Without a thought, our hands fit a motor for the left and right tracks and align the treads and set the Tarba pet back on the belt. It's odd to watch your hands work like a pit crew. Above the stations, a bank of monitors shows technical schematics and 3D models of the Tarba Pets internals. Time on, our time on each unit is clocked to the hundredth. We do not look at these things. To look at these things is to forget who you are. If you want to remember who you are, you have to live in your mind. I taught my son how to climb a coconut palm when he was eight, Hassan says. You're a good father, I say. I told him, always choose the palm that is leaning. Even a child can climb a leaning palm. That's good advice. He fell a lot, children will fall. But I told him, I said, don't worry, pain is the greatest of teachers. Hassan wipes his forehead. Above the surgical mask, his eyes dart as he checks the parts he needs. The tracks are the trickiest. You have to slot them in and tighten a screw with a pneumatic tool. Hassan fumbles with the tool and the screw and the track. His hands are the big hands of a builder. He was a builder once. None of us are anything anymore. So climb, I told him. Cut the largest coconut for your mother. We've had this conversation before, many, many times. Next, a son will tell me a boy could live in a coconut palm as long as he had a machete. A machete would cut off the husk. A boy like my boy, a strong boy, he could live in a coconut palm as long as he had a machete. To cut off the husks, I say. Precisely, to cut off the husks. You could live for months. You could drink coconut water. You could eat the lizards. Months, a boy like my boy, why not? Why not, I say, but my heart isn't in it. As long as you had a machete, any old thing would do. The pneumatic tools whiz. My heart isn't in it because today is January 15. In better worlds, in a better time, January 15 had been my father's birthday. Musa Rumair, the legendary hero, the voice of the people. In this world, a flatter and duller world, full of the hiss of pneumatics, the ring of shift change bells, in this world, no one celebrates birthdays. You celebrate the moment when the conveyor jams and you can stand still for one or two minutes. You celebrate an extra egg at breakfast, even if you have to steal it. You celebrate the fact you can recite couplets from the great poet Rumi, even with a mind numbed by schematics. Musa Amer would not have celebrated these things. Musa Amer would have revolted, risen up, and pressed his thumbs through the eye holes of his oppressors. I am not my father. Let me tell you this. You develop a sense of awareness standing in the boredom of the assembly line all day. Even the smallest change strikes you. A new brand of powderless latex glove, a misshapen tab of pet arm, these things set your heart thumping and your neurons firing with the sudden possibilities. So now, as the men in our road turn in their workstations to look around, I'm hyper aware that this is something new. The clock reads 11.37, two hours until lunch. The others lean back and look around, and I lean back and look around just as they do. We're all dressed in anti-static gowns, hairnets and masks, as if we're all cloned from the same genome. We fizz with anxiety. Back to work. It's a team of detention enforcement officers. They walk up row 14C in a triangle formation. My hands find another shell and fit another track, but I'm staring at the DEOs and wondering what they want. 
The first of them, the captain, he draws his flick bat and extends it to length, and he counts off in loud English the workstations they pass. 22, 24, 26. He points at the numbers affixed to the metal shelving overhead. He stops. They all stop. 28, he says. 28 is Hassan's station. The DEO's form a ring around Hassan. He's watching them over his shoulder and his eyes have grown round and white. He keeps working because to stop working is unionism. Hassan is not a unionist. With a wave of his baton, the captain calls him forward. Out here, he says. Hassan is looking at me and looking at the captain. The moment he steps away from his workstation, a productivity alarm begins to sound. One of the officers disables it, but not before the sound has set our anxiety fizzing even harder. The captain directs Hassan into the aisle. Move back, that's the way, over here. The captain is called Ramatullah, and he's an Afghani. We all know this man, the head of security for the centre. He was named head, we think, because he's a Muslim like us. Affinity, tolerance, you get the idea. Nobody's saying a word. Hassan is holding his arms straight out while the DEO pats him down for weapons. The captain lifts the device off his belt and scans Hassan's face. His forehead furrows. What's your number, he says. Anakan, then you know. English, the captain says, speak English. I try to turn, try to speak without ceasing my work. I'm no unionist either. His English is not very good and he's nervous, I say over my shoulder, while my hands continue to assemble a sapphire blue title pen. What's his number, the captain says. 40768, we've swapped our workstations today, sir. And then it strikes me, Hassan is standing at my workstation. I offered him my place because of the way the conveyor runs. In station 28, you've longer to pick up the next tub of pet than you do in station 26. Hassan needs those extra seconds more than I do. Then which of you blokes is 40455? I am, I say, and my voice sounds small. The officers push Hassan back towards his station. Step out here, the captain says. I step out. My productivity alarm wails. That's it, mate. Just hold your arms up for me, the officer says. On his shirt is the KB Yasuda Corrections logo. A C and a Y and a C, set across a dark rectangle, like three doves outlined on a black sky. Mask, he says. I lower the surgical mask while the captain scans my face with his glasses. He calls up my record. He makes a page-turning motion. I can't see the virtual objects that he sees, but he pushes them here and there, and then he says, Yuman Ali Umer. It's the first time in three months I've been here that a DEO has used my name. To them, I'm 40455, always 40455. Date of birth, June 5, 2049, he says. Is something wrong, I say. He looks around at the other officers. Occupation, chef. They all laugh. She's probably after his recipe, says another one. This has the captain smiling. They only eat bloody curry. I'm not actually a chef, I say. I'm a housekeeper. An officer takes me by the arm and steers me along the aisle. This is Eagle Hawk, the captain says. There aren't any chefs in Eagle Hawk. There aren't any bloody housekeepers either. No, we're unlawful non-citizens. That is the total sum of us. Have I done something wrong, I say to the captain. He ignores me. I look back at my workstation. Even now, as I'm being led away, I'm worried about my quota. Missing my daily quota means a deduction from my wage. I don't want a deduction. I see Hassan trying to screw the tracks to body frames while watching me at the same time. Another productivity alarm sounds as Tarba pets pile before his station like crashed cars. I shake my head to tell him, keep working. But he seems to take it as a sign that I'm in danger and he stops work entirely. He leans on the low partition wall and I see his mask suck in and out as he breathes. Now both of us miss our quotas. I grow angry. I twist my arm out of the officer's grip. Where are we going, I say. Not clever. The officer lifts a spray can off his belt. Hey, he says, hands behind your back. I'm not resisting, I say, but I am resisting. My father fought police in front of the people's majelis, carrying nothing but sticks and stones. What would he do here? I already know what he would do here. Hands behind your back and turn around, the officer says. Just tell me where. Before I finish, I'm grabbed around the neck from behind thick and hairy arm. It belongs to the captain. He holds me while the other men zip tie my hands in front. All along row 14C, men are staring over their masks. Captain Ramatala shoves me forward. We walk, and I'm listing the things I might have done wrong. Wasted glue at my station, assembled a faulty unit. On Wednesday, I'd been 30 seconds late to start work, and that wouldn't go unpunished. Yet, I'm being led from the building in handcuffs by the captain of security, 
Whatever I've done wrong, it must be big. Bigger than glue, bigger than stolen eggs. I'm steered along by the problems of the captain's bat. More than ever, I wish I had my father's courage. At a security hard point where we enter and exit the facility, the duty officer Davies, the young and white and acne Davies, stands for his position at the banks of X-ray monitors and takes a wand out of a drawer. There is a moment of confusion as he motions that I should raise my arms. I can't raise my arms. Davies gives a kind of a snort or a hiss as he passes the wand around me. He's a chef, the captain says. They laugh. They're all something, Davies says. In the real world, they're always something, the captain says. Laughter. What would I have bought my papa for his birthday? What he loved. That flavoursome dried skipjack Muhammad Nasir sold at the market. Limes from India. Coffee beans from Africa. He would have loved it. Fresh coffee, fresh limes, a meal of tuna curry. We exit into the hard sun and heat of Tasmania, and there the smell of gum bark and leaves and a chalky taste of the, of the gravel dust hits me. This is the Eagle Hawk Immigrant Training Centre. This smell, this chalk. The captain takes us along the sally port towards the Delta compound. I watch the diamond shadows cast through the chain link onto the path where we walk. There's a sign on the outer perimeter fence showing a symbol of a man in pain. Dangerous currents it reads, don't touch. You can hear it humming. Even over the noise from the manufactory, you can hear it humming. In a way, I'm glad my father's dead. This place would have killed him. 37, the captain says. He must be talking about the weather. 30 fucking seven, one of the officers says. Fuck me, says the other one. Jesus fucking Christ. The Australians are men of great elegance. <laughs> <laughs> it's prayer time in the recreation yard. I try to keep my eyes averted as we pass a group of men kneeling on cardboard boxes. They ask God most gracious and merciful for help finding a straight way. They look at me as they stand and throw their arms in the air and you can see that even for the smallness of their own lives, as small as this place has made them, they believe me the smallest of us all. Am I small? My cousin Shaddy Thorick certainly believes so. I keep my eyes averted because I'm afraid of seeing him. He's the most devout of all the men in Eagle Hawk ITC. Me? I'm the Ladini, the atheist, the unbeliever. What a couple we make, the faithful and the insincere. Being locked in here with him is like being locked in a cage with a gorilla. Sooner or later, he's gonna tear my arms off. Another sally port, another security point. That'll do, the captain says. The officers turn and walk away and I'm steered into the sally port by the captain alone. The head of security. It seems they consider me some sort of threat. The final door, a, a door of glass and steel, unseals and sucks back and a blast of air conditioning washes by. This is the administration block. I've been in here before, just once before. The cameras in the dormitory had recorded me crying. Everything has been taken away from us, you realise. Everything. Crying? It's natural. But natural or not, I was summoned to the facility's psychiatrist. Her name was Dr. Zara. Her face in her hijab was small and delicate, her eyebrows manicured into perfect curves. She had no counsel of any use. She was a Shia of Iraqi heritage, and like a Shia, she looked at me with distaste. What could she say to a Sunni man who has nothing? A man reduced to a binary state of sleep, work, sleep, work. So she gave me tablets. I swapped the tablets to Abdullah for a bag of desiccated coconut, from which I now and then take a handful to eat. In this taste of home, I find comfort. Listen to me, the captain says. Are you listening? We've reached a conference room at the end of the corridor. I said, are you listening? I'm listening. You lay one hand on her, and I'll bring you down to a fucking end. I look at him. Sorry? The captain pushes open the conference room door. Inside the room is a chair. Sit there. Don't fucking move. Lay a hand on who, I say. But my heart is already rattling. A fucking ant. You hear me? He says, and you know full well who. I do, I do know who. There is only one person he could be talking about. My heart rattles hard. He locks the door. There's only one person he could be talking about. I want to stand and move around. I want to be standing to meet her. As a way to calm my mind, I study the posters on the walls. They seem to show my future through pictures of smiling brown skinned citizens overlaid with slogans. Productivity is the Australian way. Association is unionism. Now the features an African man hard at work in the Australian sunshine. New life, new labours, it says. It's no good, it doesn't work. I stand and press my ear to the door. I have to know if she's here. There is only one person that can be. After a long interval, the lock in the door turns. I shift back. 
The captain enters and I begin to apologize for something. I don't even know what, perhaps for standing up, but a woman is following the captain into the room and I find myself staring at her. She's staring back at me. A thunderstorm crosses my soul. It's Rin Braden and she's found me. Thank you.